Good evening, and a very, very warm welcome to each and every one of you here to St. Paul's this evening. My name is Mark Oakley, and it is my real pleasure to introduce our speaker to you in just a moment. But for those of you who've not been to one of our events here before, let me just quickly explain how it works. In a moment, Rowan Williams will speak about what a Christian Christmas might look like and what it might mean. And he'll speak for about 35 to 40 minutes. And then we will have plenty of time for you to ask questions. And if you have a question, we ask you to write it on the back of your program and then to hold it up at any stage to be collected. We won't think that you're asking to be excused, so don't worry. Just hold it up boldly and they'll be collected and we'll collect them all in until around 7.40. Please try and keep the questions brief and legible. We're also taking questions this evening via Twitter using the hashtag Rowan Williams. If you'd like to send us your question through your mobile, just type in your question and include hashtag Rowan Williams and we'll find it. And by the sizzling hot technology of the Church of England, these questions will then find themselves up here on my screen. And I'll ask as many of those questions as I can, I promise. We will end at eight o'clock and there's a bookstall here where you can buy some of Bishop Rowan's books, and he's very kindly said he'll be happy to sign copies at the desk over there. Please do help keep the queue flowing if you join it. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker. For all those of you here who are a little unsure as to who he is, Rowan Williams is the master of Magdalen College, Cambridge. He was before that the Archbishop of Wales and then the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury. He's been a professor of theology at Oxford University, taught at various theological colleges, written an astonishing number of books on an astonishing number of subjects, and has been a teacher, an inspiration, and a friend to more people, directly and indirectly, than we could ever fit into this cathedral in a month. This is, tonight, one of the very busiest evenings we've ever had in our adult learning program here. And I think that speaks both of our longing to recover our connection to the stable, to the one born there, to the fearless message of angels to an anxious world and of faith best translated in peace and goodwill, loving the neighbour as oneself instead of hating the neighbour as oneself with our cruelest projections, but also to our belief that we have exactly the right guide to open that story to us afresh, to make Christmas spiritually pregnant again. This is the last in a year-long series about the great seasons of the church's year, which we started back in February with Archbishop Justin talking about what a good Lent might be. Christmas approaches. I am already a black belt in shopping. And as Elliot warns, very much in danger of being distracted from distraction by distraction, filled with fancies and empty of meaning. There is surely something more than important about us being here on a dark evening, in a dark time, to contemplate the mystery of God's body language, born in an insignificant place and spoken in oppressed times. Unafraid to reason and unashamed to adore, a dispeller of illusions but never disillusioned, one person we know will always help us capture the resonances, 
and he's here with us now. Would you please welcome Rowan Williams? Thank you very much indeed, Mark. <clears throat> I shouldn't be surprised if some of you had sung one or two carols in the last week or so. But I'm going to begin by suggesting that there are three kinds of carols, only one of which is really very relevant to what I want to talk about tonight. The first kind of carol is basically isn't it cold? Shouldn't we be having a jolly time? See Jingle Bells, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, Deck the Halls with Bows of Holly, etc. The second kind of carol is Isn't the Baby Sweet? Away in a manger, once in Royal David's City, and so forth. But there's a third kind of Christmas carol which contains all sorts of rather disturbing, unusual, and incomprehensible ideas. And you'll be delighted to know that it's the disturbing, incomprehensible stuff I want to talk about tonight. I'm thinking here of things like the second verse of O Come All Ye Faithful, or indeed the second verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and, perhaps rather surprisingly, we three kings of Orient. And to find a way into thinking about what a Christian Christmas might involve our reflecting on, I'm going to take those three carols and think aloud about them for a few minutes with you. The second verse of O Come All Ye Faithful begins, you remember, God of God, light of light. Lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb, very God, begotten, not created. These densely packed, mostly fourth century words still mysteriously retain a lot of popularity. What on earth are they saying? The second verse of O Come All Ye Faithful is an attempt to answer the question, who is it who is at the center of the Christmas story? The answer is, it is the king of angels. It is God who is at the center of the story. But not simply God as such but God from God. God's life boiling over from eternity into time. God's life communicating itself so completely that it makes human life unrecognizably different. And when we've sung God from God, we go on to use one of the most ancient and powerful images for what that means. Light from light. The early Christian writers were deeply preoccupied with the search for images that would allow you to say that the life of God truly flows out from God into the world and yet leaves God undiminished. And what is that like? like lighting a candle from another candle, like a flame lit from a flame. There's no less of the first after you've lit the fire. God from God, light from light. Action, energy that flows out from God and which is no less than God because the God we believe in is a God whose very nature is to share life. 
There is nothing of God that is not sharing. Nothing of God that is not giving. And God, the God we believe in as Christians, is a God who holds nothing back. That is the divine nature. God gives what God is. Very God, truly God, begotten, not created. Because there's no beginning to this outflowing and boiling over that is the life of God in relation to us. There was no point at which it started, no point at which God said, perhaps I ought to get out more. From eternity, God bestows and gives. And it's in this flowing out and boiling over of God's life that the world itself has its being and its life and its order and meaning. So that when at the end of all those carol services we hear read the first verses of St. John's Gospel about the word that was in the beginning with God, the word in whom was life, a life which was the light of humankind, it's all to do with the same set of themes. So, let's, for a moment, leave that insight to simmer on the Christmas stove and move on. We've seen that this carol celebrates a birth which is the beginning in our world of a life in which God is alive in a unique way. The God whose life and action is always just below the surface of our world breaks through like an underground stream gushing up at this moment in Bethlehem 2,000 odd years ago. Something begins for us. It's not the beginning of God being God, but it's the beginning of God being God like this in our hearts and minds. But this is where we flick forward in the pages to start singing Hark the Herald Angels. Because when God begins this life among us, when this birth happens that inaugurates a new way for God to be with us, God doesn't pick apart the fabric of the world and intrude like another person, another thing in the ordinary way. God works out the gift of divine life for us through a human life like ours. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell. Take away the obviously problematic man language, which we're all duly sensitized to these days. And what that verse says is God makes the difference by living humanly, as humanly as you and I do. And that's an extraordinary claim. You'd think, wouldn't you, that if God were going to act, God would do what we expect God to do, and in the words of the prophet, rend the heavens and come down. That great critic and philosopher and scourge of um, lazy thinking agnostics, Terry Eagleton, has said that some people seem to think it would help if one day there was a large banner displayed in the sky saying, I'm up here, you idiots. God habitually works not by breaking into the world, but by filling 
at the world from within. And so here we have that extraordinary affirmation, pleased as man with man to dwell. God delights to be human alongside human beings. And in this life that begins at Bethlehem, there is no little corner or gap where humanity breaks off and God starts. Everything is soaked through with the divine energy and love and light. This is a human life. And as another carol says, tears and smiles like us he knew. In the pages of the Bible, we read the same thing repeatedly. The Jesus we encounter in the New Testament is no Superman. He asks, he weeps, he depends. We're told in the letter to the Hebrews that he feels tempted. His will sometimes appears to wobble like ours. There's a state of uncertainty, and yet the life moves on. The decisions are made, and the unbroken course and flow of God's life in Jesus continues. God, having made the world, in other words, doesn't interrupt it. God respects it and works within it. God changes things not by command or force exercised from outside. God changes the world in its own terms and its own life. Changes the world by establishing human relationships, which is, believe it or not, why the church is still here. God redefines the capacities of human life. Back to the carol. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. What's going on in this life beginning in the stable is that human capacity is being altered. What we can say and think and imagine about human beings has suddenly expanded beyond all measure. Exploded, we could almost say. Here is complete divine creative freedom contained in a real vulnerable human life. Born the king of angels, tears and smiles like us he knew. God of God, light of light, Jesus wept. Even in the baby in the manger, absolute and creative freedom is alive. Alive in a way that will animate and shape the whole of the human life that unfolds ahead. The whole of the life ahead. And that takes us to the third carol, because this is only the beginning. God remakes, redefines human nature from within, but does it by defenseless love. Not by winning arguments and not by winning battles. Indeed, you might almost say, by losing arguments and losing battles. If my kingdom came from this world, says Jesus, my servants would be fighting. And whenever you see Jesus' servants fighting, you might reasonably conclude that um, the kingdom is of this world. But that's another story. We three kings of Orient, once you've separated from the jolly knees-bending tune, contains 
all of that. Glorious now, behold him arise, king and God and sacrifice. God changes things by letting go. Instead of living out a life that is protected and successful in human terms, God lets go. Jesus entrusts himself to unreliable people like you and me. God puts his life, you could say, in the hands of fragile, tempted, muddled, and fearful people. And whatever the details and whatever the theories, we're told unambiguously in the Christian scriptures that it's Christ's exposure to pain and death and failure that somehow mysteriously makes the difference, makes the change that is affirmed in the resurrection from the dead and the giving of the Holy Spirit. This is a story which gives us a model of a God who will not use force upon us and a humanity that will not defend itself for its own sake. We sing these carols with gusto year by year. We repeat these strange, lumpy, difficult words. We quote without realizing it from Pope Leo the Great and the Te Deum Laudamus and the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. And it doesn't do us any harm because these big and lumpy words, these somewhat mind bending ideas, are what Christmas is about. What we celebrate at Christmas is not the birth of a particularly sweet and harmless baby, nor even the welcome possibility of having a few extra drinks in the middle of winter. We celebrate a set of discoveries about God and about humanity. Or, as Christians have regularly said, not so much discoveries as revelations. We are shown something about God. That the God we believe in is not a God who has to be lured down from heaven by being very, very polite to him or behaving extra well. We are dealing with a God who can't help himself overflowing, boiling over into the world that he has made. A God who cannot give less than the life that is the divine life. We're dealing, in other words, with a God who doesn't have to be persuaded to be interested in us. And that's quite a good start. And one way of keeping a Christian Christmas might be to look at what relics there are in our minds and hearts of an approach to God which still believes that God is essentially rather bored with us, rather removed from us, and always in need of being kept sweet. However long you've been a Christian, or however long you've been looking wistfully at Christianity from outside, that's something which keeps obstinately coming back. I speak as a sinner to sinners, you understand. That's deeply etched in our minds. The mythology of a God who somehow has to be persuaded to be on our side. You might as well try to persuade a waterfall to be wet. But there's more. 
The way in which that overflow impacts upon us is not by force or command. It's by a solidarity, an identification so deep, so serious and total that we can only say when we see Jesus, we see God, and we see, therefore, a God who values our humanity beyond all imagining. So the second question about how we keep a Christian Christmas is to ask some awkward questions about how we value human lives, how we value the lives immediately around us, how we value the lives that impact upon us in negative, dangerous and difficult ways, how we value the lives that appear not to be especially significant or effective or efficient. If we take seriously what these carols say, we ought to be looking with speechless amazement at every human face. God thought this face was worth everything. God thought this person was worth everything. God thought, God thinks, that there is no gift or risk too great to bring full life and joy to this person. And God thought and thinks that this person can reflect something of the massive generosity that is God's own act and nature. It's possibly the hardest thing in the Christian faith to accept or understand. That radical sense that wherever we turn, we see a humanity God has believed to be supremely worthwhile. Of course, day by day, we make our little judgments and we take our sides. We think unthinkingly that such and such a life is obviously less worthwhile than another. We think the lives of our enemies are less worthwhile than the lives of our friends. And while there are monumentally difficult decisions to make in our world about the use of force, about defense and war and the like, the one thing the Christian has to be sure of is that wherever we turn, the human life we see is a life as valuable as ours. And if our actions diminish or destroy it, that is nothing for triumph and all for tragedy. You could say that God's attitude to human nature is a bit like that of some master craftsman restoring an ancient and wonderful musical instrument. Looking at the old and damaged instrument, the craftsman might say, well, I could repair this with a bit of synthetic material, with a bit of composite here and a bit of glue there but it's not actually going to perform what it's capable of performing unless I work very hard with the grain of the wood and replace what's worn out with the same material because that material is good and it's that material which is capable of singing. So God approaches our humanity. God doesn't say, with a bit of luck, I might find some moral plastic substitute that will fill in the gaps. 
God says, humanity itself needs to be inhabited and transfigured from within. So how do we look at that humanity, even in its distorted, violent, threatening forms, even when we feel driven to those difficult decisions which now we face in the defense of our society? And then the third question that comes about a Christian Christmas has to do with that last and hardest set of ideas. Yes, God's life overflows into our humanity. Yes, God inhabits our humanity fully in the life of Jesus. And then, yes, that inhabiting takes the form of an immense risk-taking and letting go, an immense attention to the reality of the other, a defenselessness that we ought to find deeply frightening. A Christian Christmas is a time when we ought to be overwhelmed, both with the surprise of God's nearness, the glory of the humanity that God restores, and at the same time alarmed, properly alarmed, by the radical nature of the claim made. If, if we are to be given second birth, if as children of earth we are to be raised, there is a letting go, a letting down of our defenses against one another and against God, which is the path to fullness of humanity. Not very welcome and anything but easy. And yet, mysteriously, here we are singing about it. God help us. And we only have the courage to sing about it I dare say, because somehow or other we have begun to hear the good news of what kind of God our God is and the good news of what our humanity might be. And in the light of that, just possibly, we're able to say that is a way, a life, which I want to be possible for myself and for the world. So a Christian Christmas ought to be a very surprising time. A time when we look at our stale pictures and thoughts about God and about humanity and let them be refreshed by the newness of what comes into the world in Bethlehem. There's another carol not popularly sung, but often included in rather high-class carol concerts, begins with the words, a new work is come on hand. A new work is come on hand. Something becomes possible in our imagining of God and our imagining of humanity and of our own lives. And as we sing and celebrate, the thing we ought most earnestly to pray for this and every Christmas is that we shan't lose the sense of surprise. The surprise that prevents us from thinking of God as a distant autocrat. The surprise that will prevent us from thinking of human beings as a sad lost cause or else as an absolutely successful and self-sufficient enterprise. The God who overflows in love, the humanity which God has trusted to reveal the depth of divine life. That's not obvious, and the surprising nature of it needs to be reaffirmed again and again. 
The whole point of Advent, that lost cause apart from chocolate calendars, is to give us a little bit of space to remember what it might be like not to believe all that, so that Christmas comes surprisingly. And even if Advent is a bit of a lost cause in our culture, that's no excuse for Christians not to try and clear the space, clear that room in the straw, as it were, of the stable, to let themselves be amazed once again and to come and adore. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bishop Rowan. Can I now uh, remind all of you out there that it's your time to ask your questions. Please do write them down on your program. Hold them up high. They will be collected, uh, and uh, then I'll begin uh, asking your questions on your behalf. Can I just start on, on something that struck me very much? Is this, this perennial feeling that Christians can have that we have to somehow win God over. We have to convince God to love us. Um, it always has, strikes me that perhaps we, we fear God, not because God is fierce and vengeful, but because God is real. A and we aren't a lot of the time. But what is it that's working inside us that, that makes us believe that somehow God has to be won over towards us. What, what, what's going on there? What's the projecting? Does this work while I'm sitting down? Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> if you can't hear me, shout. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's a, a very searching question, I think, because I think there are several things going on in us. One of them is that, of course, we quite like to think that we are loved because we're lovable, that we earn the love we have, and we get into a fearful tangle about whether we're lovable or not because of all that, and somehow, therefore, we assume that ultimate and eternal love must work on the sort of gold star in primary school principle. Then there's, of course, as you hinted in your introductory observations, Mark, the sense that we, we hate others as we hate ourselves, that we don't much like what we see when we look within, and we can't imagine what it would be like simply to be embraced without question, even if that then transforms and challenges. So the mixture of the longing to earn love and the deep conviction that we can't gets us into a, a real tangle here. And I think that, that is so much what the gospel story again and again drives us back to, that the Jesus we encounter in the gospels is the one who says, the step has already been taken. The question now is whether you can believe that that step has been taken by God. And when Jesus says, repent and believe, he doesn't mean go to confession and sign up. He means change your mind and trust. Trust what I'm telling you about God. And it was difficult enough to get him crucified. Because there are so many voices, aren't there, uh, uh, coming at every which way at us, which would diminish and simmer us down. Mm. I'm always struck when Jesus is baptized. He, literally, those voices from the shore are drowned out in order that he comes up to hear the one voice, one voice. that matters. But that, hearing that one voice at the moment, how? How do we do that? How indeed. Jesus 
comes up from the depths of chaos, and the first thing he hears is, you are the child that I love. Mm. So the question, I suppose, is how do we raise our, our eyes that little bit out of chaos to hear what Jesus heard? Mm. You are the child that I love. And that has to have something to do with diagnosing a little bit about the chaos within us, finding the space and the quiet to lift our heads, challenging the profound anxiety that keeps us paralyzed. And there's, I think, no answer but that finding space somewhere. Mm -hmm. Questions are coming in. Please, please keep writing them and holding them up. But um, God doesn't need to be persuaded to be interested in us but it often seems people need to be persuaded to be interested in God. Mm. Where has the church or God gone wrong? Mm. Well, assuming that God doesn't need my advice on this, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll concentrate on the church. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if, if God has made a mistake, frankly, it's us. I mean, human beings. And one of the difficult things sometimes to trust is that God knew what he was doing when he created human beings. There's that wonderful passage in the Quran where the angels protest to God about the creation of human beings and basically say, do you, do you know what you're doing? And God, of course, says, yes, he does, and says, you'd be surprised. So what have we done wrong? Well. I suppose the constant issue for the church is how to convey the truth that faith enlarges rather than shrinks our humanity. The people who have spiritual authority in the world are on the whole people who seem to have more rather than less to their humanity. People love Desmond Tutu because he's funny, he's at home with himself, and he's fearless. Now, that's quite a good start. And I think people see in that, well, again, a sort of overflow. I guess that people love Pope Francis because he gives that sense of being at home with himself. That this is not a, a pinched and nervous kind of humanity. And so often, of course, the church gives the pinched and nervous version. And if people are interested at all, they'll possibly be interested only in how humanity can possibly go that wrong, which is not a good start. I suspect people become interested in God when they look at certain lives lived in God's company. I mean, the church often seems to take the small opportunities to be mean instead of the large opportunities to be generous. But I wonder if it's caught up with what we've just been saying, that actually we can't quite believe that God is so exuberantly mm. loving yeah. and generous. I have occasionally used the metaphor of the church thinking of God as a sort of mad old millionaire, <laughs> and the family has to gather around and stop him signing away all his, all his possessions to a dog's home, as it were. Oh. God as Donald Trump. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> there are mad millionaires and mad millionaires. <laughs> but you know, we, we are, so to speak, the dog's home. We, are, we, humanity, are the unlikely recipients of this slightly mad generosity. And yes, it's very hard for the church to believe it, and anybody to. And often with the best will in the world, we think, well, it can't really mean that, and God must be more cautious than that. And that's when I think again of all those unlikely stories in the Gospels about people being forgiven and picked up from the roadside and, yeah, the, the unpredictable generosity stuff. Yeah. You focused on um, carols and uh, questions come in saying two of the Gospel writers weren't interested in nativity stories, mm. why should we be? 
That's a very good question. First of all, because they're very good stories, and we need good stories. And I think they're good stories for a number of reasons. Look at St. Matthew's version. The first thing we learn about St. Joseph is that he was a good chap. He was an upright man. And so, of course, being an upright person, he didn't want to marry Mary. And so one of the things that Matthew chapter 1 tells us is maybe uprightness isn't the end of the story here. And then Matthew goes on with the very, very challenging second chapter, which first of all portrays these exotic and rather dangerous characters, not so much we three kings of Orient, as three you know, druids or shamans. You know, they're really um, strange figures, new agey figures, turning up out of nowhere, as if to say, the first people who recognize what's going on are the least likely people. So there's quite a lot going on in those stories. And then, of course, in Matthew 2, you have the terrifying fact that as soon as something utterly life-giving happens, there will always be murderous violence around trying to shut it up. And the birth of Jesus doesn't just happen in a sort of snow-covered rural idyll. It happens in an environment like South Sudan, where, you know, massacres of children happen, where people flee to other countries to escape brutality. That's quite a start with Matthew alone. Luke, Luke again, tells you that the first people to recognize are rather unlikely. Luke begins his nativity story with this tremendous trumpet blast, it came to pass in the days of Caesar Augustus. And we are suddenly reminded of the fact that Caesar Augustus, the most powerful man in the world of his day, is known to most people only as a footnote to the Christmas story. So that God's perspective on who matters in the world at any given point is going to be a slightly odd one. And, well, I could go on, but you know, th these are reasons for being interested in the stories. That Mark and John apparently were not interested, um, that, that's fine by me, <laughs> because they have other things to say. Mark wants you to feel the absolute surprise of Jesus' arrival on the public scene. Not so much his birth, but this explosion of good news, apparently from nowhere, from a grown-up peasant between 30 and 40 living in some half-forgotten province of the empire. And John, as we've seen, begins with a very different kind of nativity story, which is the birth of the eternal birth of generosity in God's everlasting life. So I think they, you know, they slot together here and there. What do you think, though, about, I mean, the composite story of Christmas that's come into being uh, through the Nine Lessons and Carols, for instance, uh, which we could all recite here, but which is nowhere to be found in any Gospel as, as it stands in our, in our imagination? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I, I don't lose too much sleep over it because <laughs> I think it's, as, as it stands, it's a tremendously... Um, powerful collective legend. Now, from time to time, we need to go back to what the Gospels actually say mm. and to the, the rather tougher and more fragmentary way in which the story is told. Mm. We need, and that's part of what I'm talking about tonight, I suppose, we need to find our way past the sentimentality mm. of the collective story. But God forbid that anybody should say that this great corporate work of art, which the church has refined over these ages, is, is bad for us. I think the, the collective tableau of angels and shepherds and wise men is a tremendously powerful statement 
of all the things that theologically we want to say, that this is the king of angels, that this is the shepherd of humankind, that this is the wisdom of God, that the child is recognized in heaven and on earth. So, yes, I, I think the, the myth, if you like, the, the composite picture isn't bad for us. But if it's all we ever have, that's a shame, which is why it's important we do keep reading what the texts actually say. A couple of questions have come in. What's your favorite carol, and what do you dread singing? <laughs> oh, dear. Yes, this is the sort of thing that gets into uh, tomorrow's Daily Mail, isn't it? <laughs> um. <laughs> <clears throat> the Guardian, I think. <laughs> Probably my favourite carol is Of the Father's Heart Begotten. Um, not the best known, but partly it's a wonderful, resonant medieval tune. And these colossal images of the Father's heart begotten ere the world from chaos rose. Mm. You know, that's, that's taking you right into the, the middle of things. I, I really love that. What do I dread singing? Um, well, let's keep jingle bells out of it for the moment. Um, well... This will, of course, alienate three quarters of the audience, whatever I say. <laughs> I think it's a toss-up between the full version of It Came Upon the Midnight Clear and Away in a Manger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Part of, me, part of me loves both of them because they both have lovely tunes and quite lovely words, but... It came up on the midnight clear, comes to this um, business about with the ever-circling years comes around the age of gold. And you know, the, the world is automatically getting better. And you may have noticed that it isn't. And I don't really like singing lies in church. So I really object to that, actually. Away in a manger, I, I don't know, I oscillate on that because it's so close to just... Oh, isn't he sweet? And it also has that rather un unlikely statement that the little Lord Jesus no crying he makes. <laughs> and as I, as I think I once said, that strikes me as a considerable first miracle. <laughs> because a, a baby waking up surrounded by large farm animals, um, I would guess a certain amount of natural human apprehension would kick in. Yes. You've just ruined my Christmas. I, I knew I would for something. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Actually, working here, let me tell you, it's death by little donkey. I, uh... <clears throat> um, how do we explain meaningfully the tradition of the virgin birth in this secular day and age? Ask somebody. Gosh, yes, that's a very big question. I think the first thing I'd want to say about it is I don't think that the tradition of the virginal conception is anything to do originally with being awkward or afraid about sex. It's only much later that you know, virginity as a value in itself comes to be so important in the church. It's not, it's not as such in the New Testament. So we have to think this is a story about the absolute priority of the action of God in Jesus' life from the very first moment when there is anything there in the womb of Mary. It is God's action that is going on. Now, people will disagree about the historical basis for the virginal conception. I'm actually rather conservative about it myself. But the important thing is the story is saying Remember all those stories in Hebrew scripture about God bringing a life to birth where no, no life was expected. Abraham and Sarah and um, Hannah and Samuel and so on. Well, just ratchet that up a stage further and imagine a life that's not only 
brought into being by God, but actually embodies God's act. That's what we're talking about. It's, it's picking up, and Luke is especially good at this, picking up the echoes, the language, the, the rhythms of the old stories in Hebrew scripture, and saying, now we're going to take this just an inch further over another edge. And I think that's where I'd want to put the emphasis in thinking about the virginal conception. It's difficult though, isn't it, when if you're just trying to do a, a service at Christmas with a lot of people who don't have those old stories Absolutely. in their cupboard, in their mental cupboard, uh, when they hear the word virgin being emphasised, they think, oh, church got a hang up about sex. That's right, yes. Why would they think that? Well, don't look at me. I... <laughs> yes, I mean, that, 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 is one, that is one of the problems, isn't it? Um, and I, I don't have a quick answer to that. No. Um, but it, yeah. Because the church has had a hang-up about sex, and it kind of casts a shadow over all of this. But that's where I think the, the two sides of the story, the complete initiative of God and the complete enthusiastic yes of Mary, yeah. that can still be an exciting story in itself. A couple of questions, um, which are not the same, but I'll, I'll say both of them because they're connected, maybe. As an atheist, what specific aspects of a Christian Christmas should I recognize at this time of year that are not already universal human values? Mm. And, and secondly, is there a Christian message at Christmas to people of other faiths? Thanks for both of those. Um, I would like, I think, to note quite simply that even if we speak of universal human values, those universal values had a beginning historically. They didn't just fall from a rational heaven. The world into which Jesus was born was a world which did not take universal human dignity for granted. Quite the contrary. And it's taken quite a long time for anything remotely like the Christian sense of human dignity to establish itself with any degree of universality in our society. So I think what I want to say is it's not obvious. It doesn't hurt to remember where it started and how we got to it. And there are aspects of this story which quite simply put before us an extravagant, ambitious picture of humanity, even in its most vulnerable and incipient form in a baby, that are just, I'd say, special to the Christian narrative. Nobody much in the ancient world was in interested in universal human dignity. Nobody much was interested in babies, actually. And when you think that the Roman Empire sanctioned the killing and abandonment of unwanted newborn children, you do see that the stuff about babies in mangers and born the king of angels is not just sentimental claptrap. So I hope that something of that would come in. The other thing, of course, which I focused on, which was rethinking a picture of God, isn't going to be much use to an atheist, except that it's quite important to know what God you're not believing in. And, um, well, you know, a lot of the time the God people don't believe in is a God that I don't much believe in either. But that's, again, that's another story. As for other faiths, without wanting to go off into another lecture, don't worry, about interfaith relations. I think, first of all, it's quite important that Christians do know their own story and why and how it matters, not be embarrassed about that. And I think we also need, at Christmas as at other times, to keep our eyes and ears open for the ways in which other religious families feel their way towards some of the same affirmations. Because I don't think it helps much to say only Christians believe in love or something like that, 
or Christians believe in love and Jews believe in justice and Muslims believe in something else again. That's rubbish. If, as Jews and Muslims would say, we're all talking about the same set of stories about God initially, the God who speaks to Abraham, we would expect some family resemblances. And it's no bad thing to let our appreciation and our understanding of Christmas allow us to be generous and thoughtful in response to those echoes we hear elsewhere. And if you were still the Archbishop of Canterbury, and <laughs> I'm just watching your reaction to that idea, uh, if you were still the Archbishop of Canterbury and you had to preach on Christmas morning, uh, watched by the world, the world that is so anxious at the moment in so many ways and on the defensive, what part of the, Christian, of the Christmas story would you be focusing on? Hmm. Preaching every year in Canterbury on Christmas Day with the cameras was always um, a huge challenge because part of me wanted to say some really very, very simple things. And as you may have noticed, I didn't always uh, succumb to that temptation. Um, but also I was aware that people were conscious of living in a complex world. What would I say this year? I would talk, I think, about those brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ who are currently living under daily threat of death or exile. I would talk about the way in which Christian faithfulness is not just a matter of, as I said earlier, winning all the arguments, but about being there as a neighbor and about the tragedy of those who do not want Christian neighbors. The agony of a Christian trying to live as a Christian neighbor in Syria or Iraq with those who want them dead or out. And I would want people to pray very, very hard for them. I would want some of that praying to turn round into some questioning of ourselves, how we ourselves become better neighbors in our manifold and complicated world, how we become better neighbors even to our enemies, how we become better neighbors in the long term to that agony-ridden area which is the Middle East. Because I, like others, am apprehensive that we've settled for what looks like decisive short-term action without very much clarity about the long-term well-being we want to see. And I'd ask, too, about whether we're interested in being good neighbors to the most vulnerable people of the world. I mentioned South Sudan a moment ago, and good neighbors to creation itself, thinking of the Paris Climate Summit this week. Well, there we are, a few sermon notes. I've just, I've just seen 300 preachers making notes, actually, as you were speaking for Christmas morning. I'm struck by this image of not winning all the arguments. Um, Marilyn Robinson and her novel, which many people here will know, Gilead, says nothing true will ever be said about God from a defensive posture. <clears throat> Do you think it's more important for us all to be working for a church that's more concerned to be loving than to be right? I think Marilyn Robinson is one of the very greatest Christian writers and writers we've got at the moment. I think she's full of the most extraordinary insight. And because we are always 
on the back foot, faced with the love and righteousness of God. It seems to me our first duty is honesty about our failure. Our second duty, inseparable from it, is generosity to ourselves as well as to those who've offended us and are alienated from us. And somewhere along the line, trying to sort out how it all hangs together. But if we start with that third one, we probably never get to the other two. Yeah. That's the worry. Walter Brueggemann always says that the church should, should not try to be the happiest place in town, but the more, most honest place most in town. Honest, yes, and that is one of the things that I think Marilyn Robinson's novels really do focus on, the importance of <clears throat> her sort of Christian heroes is not that they're always right, not even that they're always forgiving, but that they always struggle to be honest. Question uh, that's come in. How do you feel pagan symbols like Christmas trees have affected Christmas? Um, well, again, I'm not going to lose too much sleep over Christmas trees. You'll be glad to hear. Um, we've always surrounded our Christian festivals with the festal signs that are available um, in our culture. Um, evergreen trees, holly and ivy, or indeed the various ways in which we deploy flowers and fresh buds around Easter. I think it's to do with, again, having um, a broadly hospitable understanding of the earth we're in and the culture we belong to. And once again, as with the composite Christmas story and picture, so with the Christmas trimmings, we've, we've put together a kind of cultural unit, um, which I think doesn't, doesn't hurt. And we need, we need ritual and vehicles for celebration. This provides it. So I don't think it takes away but, again, I, I would worry if, if we reduced Christmas, as we often do, just to the midwinter festival. And it's always instructive to celebrate Christmas on the other side of the globe and realize that, no, it's actually not a midwinter festival in India or Australia or South Africa. And um, having, having sung carols about the bleak midwinter and eaten turkey and plum pudding in temperatures of 90-something in Delhi in the past, um, yes, well, that's, that's a bit odd. I, I want to separate it just from the midwinter festival. And, mm. and I don't like artificial Christmas trees either while I'm on the subject. But <laughs> <laughs> Daily Mail's having a field day at Sorry. the moment, yeah. yes. Um, there's a que there are two questions here, uh, and at the heart of them, I think, are the, are the debates, actually, what the early creed makers were about, is about the nature of Christ. Yes. But how should we consider the activity of the Trinity in this season without simply separating the persons of the Godhead? And secondly, your, your reference to hymns raises questions about the Trinity, so are we celebrating Christ's birth or God coming? Oh, both, mm -hmm. um, definitely. Um, because for a, an Orthodox Christian, Christ's birth is God's coming. But as for the Trinity, ooh, how long have you got? Um, first of all, one of the great principles of classical theology is that the whole of God is involved in all that God does. So what's happening in Bethlehem is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together. What that work issues in is the birth of Christ, who is the human shape and face of the Son. But 
This is the one who eternally proceeds from the Father and who is brought to life within the world by the coming down of the Holy Spirit. So we're told in St. Luke. So the whole of God's life is involved in shaping this event. It's not as if one day one of the three chaps who lives in heaven got up and said, I think I'll go for a walk down to earth. I'll see you later. But that the entire mystery of God, the great to and fro of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, as it were, gathers in this event on earth. And at the heart of it, the human Jesus, carrying in himself the full weight and energy of God the Word. Jesus comes to birth. So it is a Trinitarian mystery. And everything that we say about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus has to be, so to speak, plugged in to that constant interweaving of the three levels, modes, um, styles, hypostases, if you want a technical word, of the divine life. There are um, more questions coming in. Thank you very much. Uh, let's try and get through some of them. Two, two are related here. Um, I've often said uh, here that at the moment, we're, and I quote this from somebody, that uh, we're spending money we don't have on things we don't want in order to impress people we don't like. Oh. How can Christmas recover from a consumerist approach to the holiday? And then there's a little question that slipped in here. How do we know that God wants us to have celebrations? On the first one, I, I wish I had an answer. Um, it's a sort of Nobel Prize question, really. The person who cracks it really deserves a reward. I think there are a number of um, small acts of cultural disobedience we can perform, <laughs> even if they are only sending charity Christmas cards. It sounds tiny. It's one small reminder. I think if we, at least with some members of our family or friends, if we sort out that it's all right to send a donation somewhere. Um, you know, you've probably had these cards yourself. Or you, I've had them sometimes, which a little card that says, um, a cow has been sent on your behalf to Burundi. And you think, how wonderful. Now, we can all of us, at least in some of our activities in this season, do some of that countercultural stuff. How we crack it as a broad cultural issue, I really don't know, because where you're dealing with the massive vested interest of money-making at this time of year, it's not going to happen overnight, is it? So we need quite a lot of little acts of civil disobedience. How do we know God wants us to celebrate? Well, the problem is we can't stop ourselves, really. Um, I don't think people calculated that it would be nice to have a festival celebrating Christ's birth where we exchange presents. It's more that people found that with, to quote the um, King's College Cambridge prayer, people were being made glad by the yearly commemoration of Christ's birth. You can't very well say, well, you shouldn't be feeling so cheerful about it. God does what God does, partly so that human beings will have joy in him. And I don't think we should try to stifle that. How we celebrate is another matter. But that we celebrate, that we are glad, that we let our hair down and even indulge in a modicum of extravagant behavior, however we conceive that, silly hats and the like. And that's only bishops. Um, <laughs> You know, I think that's all, all to the good. Joy to the world. I'm, I'm struck that in around, I think, around 1450, it was forbidden in this part of London to wear masks. 
during Christmas oh. because people used them as an excuse to mug people in the dark on the way back from parties. But I always love the image that actually Christmas tide was the time where masks take were... Take your mask off. Take yes. your mask yes. off. Yes. It was Absolutely. forbidden. Yes. Uh, and then you might be able to celebrate it. A mm. um, couple of questions here about um, practical recalls to the amazement. Um, so first of all, how can we take Advent back to be prepared to be amazed, you use that expression, about Christmas again? Let's, let's look at that. How, what can we do to, to re-amaze, first of all, us, and then other people who will be coming into our celebrations? There are quite a number of things, aren't there, which, which people do and which probably more of us ought to do. I've been very struck by how significant a thing for some communities has been the, um, the Spanish practice, the posada. You know, you, you pass the nativity figures around from house to house. Mm. The sense of a journey, I suppose, in Advent is what matters. And take, taking, uh, you probably know schools that do this, you, you take one or more of the figures of the nativity story to your house, you take it to somebody else's house, it journeys around a community, a parish, a group of friends. There are, I think, increasingly good liturgies that places like this put on to remind you that you're not quite there yet. Um, and I think the, the reading of the prophets Everyone who's got a Bible can do that. Reading a bit of Isaiah, day by day, starting with Isaiah 40, you know, the, the beginning of Handel's Messiah, comfort my people. I think that just puts the whole thing in, in the context of expectation. Maybe we should, as a church, say to people, look, this is a time when you can actually read the prophets again, read what it was like to be looking forward and provide um, a simple Advent series of readings of the prophets that people could, could use and reflect on. And if you could change one thing at the, ab about the way we culturally celebrate Christmas at the moment, what would it be? Ooh. I suppose I would quite like a legal ban on Christmas carols and Christmas trees before the middle of November, but that's, uh, <clears throat> that's probably whistling to the moon, isn't it? <laughs> well, not a bad one. Um, our time is drawing close, but I do want to get this question in because I think perhaps we might use it as, as your final thoughts for us to take with us outside that door and, and finish Advent and into Christmas tide. But there's a question here about, um, could you give us practical ideas, and you have begun, on how to have a good Christmas. I started with thinking about reading the prophets. There they are, they're accessible, they're good translations. Second, Sing carols with your household. Don't wait for carol concerts. Sing around the table. Revolutionary social movement. Singing at home. Why don't we do more of it? And sing things that, you know, have a bit of substance to them. Ask who in the last year whether a group or a person you have most readily or gladly forgotten about and do something about it. Just as a reminder that Christmas is about God reaching out from the center of divine life to this remote arm of the galaxy, this forgotten corner of the universe as in history, 
while the center of things seems to be Caesar Augustus and the edge seems to be the stable in Bethlehem, the forgotten corner of the oppressed province. That's where the real center is. Think who you've forgotten about, who you haven't attended to. And whether that means a phone call, a donation to a charity, a visit to a local hospice or prison or detention center or whatever, just build it in as best you can because that will be in its way a sort of incarnation, to use the technical word, a fleshing out of the story we're remembering. And finally, what are you most looking forward to this Christmas? Um, no college committee meetings for a week. <laughs> um, spending several continuous days with my children. Hearing the first 14 verses of St. John's Gospel read in church because for me, the first time I hear those words each Christmas, whether it's at the climax of a carol service or in the, the mass of Christmas, that's the point at which I feel, yes, it happened. It was true then, it's true now, and will be true forever. And I just look forward to the moment of hearing it, as if for the first time. Thank you. Um, I was brought up as a boy in Shropshire, and um, at the back of my grandmother's house, I was brought up by my grandparents as a a very large field with a lot of sheep in it. And um, about three years ago, uh, Tom, who's a very elderly shepherd, was with his sheep, and he was carrying a, a shepherd's crook. And um, I joked with him that my boss back in London had one a bit similar. And we were talking, and I, I said to him, do you really use that to haul in naughty sheep? Is that what it's for? And he said, oh, no, Mark, let me tell you what this is good for. He said, I, um, I put it down into the earth so far that I can hold on to it and keep myself so still that eventually the sheep learn to trust me. I've been desperate to preach at the consecration of a bishop ever since. <laughs> but, but... <laughs> but I mention that story because I cannot think of someone who more takes us into that deep, rooted space of the soul and is keeping himself so still, though I can imagine it doesn't always feel like that with your diary, keeping yourself so still and rooted that we learn to trust what you say. You are somebody who takes us into the serious but also playful dive into the mystery of God's love and sacrifice. And you talked about celebrating a set of discoveries. I think every time people gather like this around you, they walk away with a new set of discoveries. And for that, and for all that you give us, uh, I, on behalf of everybody here, would like to thank you very deeply. Thank you. Thank you.